Okay, so um, my name is Andreas Dilger. I work now for Lamb Cloud, um, long time developer of uh, Lustre. Um, so today we're just going to talk a little bit at a, a pretty high level about um, what Lustre is and uh, it's just an introduction to uh, the various parts of Lustre to give you an idea of what it is. Would, Okay, um, I'll talk like this, if that's okay. Um, so, what is Lustre? Um, it's a GPL distributed file system that uh, is used in quite a lot of uh, HPC installations um, today. Well, I don't know about today, but as of uh, November in the top 500 list, I think seven of the top 10 systems were Lustre and it's grown to be 70% of the top 100 systems. So fairly widely adopted. Of course there's a lot of um, smaller systems that you know it, we don't track specifically because Lustre is GPL and people are free to download it and use it as they see fit. Um, so it's very scalable um, on the largest system which is a uh, well, the largest system that I have numbers about is the uh, Oak Ridge uh, Jaguar system that does uh, 240 gigabytes a second, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of cores, and um, it's uh, very large. There's also the, uh, the number one system that took over in uh, China. It's also running Lustre, but unfortunately I don't know anything about it, so <laughs> I can't say what they what their numbers are like, but um, uh, one of the, the the outstanding features of Luster is the uh, the ability to use uh, different kinds of networks and also to uh, actually really utilize the capabilities to the to the maximum of the underlying network. Um, oh, so I talk about these things, yeah. There's quite a large number of different vendors that you can get Lustre solutions from. Um, some vendors, Cray, you know, they they bundle Lustre in with their, you know, XT5 systems. Um, and then there's third-party vendors, say DDN, that you know ships a storage solution. Sometimes, you know, there are DDNs that get sold. W buy a vendor with the compute, but you can also buy the storage separately now, and um, you know that's becoming an increasing, um, increasingly popular marketplace to uh, have third-party solutions with Luster installed and configured for the specific hardware that they're running. Um, but it does it does run on virtually any kind of storage and any kind of um, server nodes. So there there is um, you know in the small to medium um, environment, there's quite a few people who have set it up themselves and are running you know with a wide variety of hardware. So this is uh, a pretty standard diagram of what a Lustre deployment looks like. Um, there's two kinds of, of environments that, um, that are set up. Um, one is in the, in the bottom here, the, uh, the straight, the direct connect client cluster, which is, is pretty popular. You have one supercomputer, you have the clients and the, the IO nodes are directly connected to your supercomputer and they have attached storage. Um, what's growing in popularity is is the top kind of configuration where you have a, a, a you know a, cl a compute cluster that is um, you know one of potentially many different compute clusters in your um, environment and uh, it's attached with um, what are lust called Lustre routers um, over some different fabric that's connected to an external cluster that's storing 
you know, the data. And that's becoming quite popular these days because um, it allows an organization to make separate purchasing decisions for the compute hardware versus the storage hardware. Um, they can upgrade their computing environment or add in new clusters without necessarily having to replace the storage at the same time. And it also allows um, data sharing uh, across the different computing environments. So you may have um, you know, in some of the larger installations, they'll have a separate uh, visualization cluster. They may have a separate, you know, um, set of nodes that are doing data archiving or external access for um, TerraGrid, you know, a grid FTP and that kind of thing. So having the separate cluster is more popular. Yeah, um, actually, let me get my laser pointer. Yeah. Is there one up there? Okay, so um, in this environment, there's these, these Lustre router nodes. And so you may have on this half of your, your cluster, this might be InfiniBand or something like that. And, um, you know, this is traditionally what would be considered a, 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 a you know, compute cluster. And on this side, um, this is the edge of your, of your cluster. And you have usually a different um, interconnect here, gig E, or it could also be, you know, if this is a Cray XT, this might be C star network, and this is an IB network over here. And then your storage nodes, these are these are um, cluster um, server nodes uh, with attached storage. This cluster could be is you know physically separate, and um, you know is not part of the the fabric that is your compute cluster. Um, no, for, for Lustre, these are, um, these, these nodes um, communicate with uh, the Lustre network protocol. And so there's a, um, the, the clients themselves don't really need to, to change their protocol. It's still a Lustre protocol from the clients to the servers. It's just that these routers do um, RDMA network bridging. Um, and so the clients will, will RDMA you know, from their memory into memory on the router node and then another RDMA hop um, over to the server nodes. And so it's transparent to the client, but it's still um, very high performance. So um, to go through some of the, the different components of Lustre, um, the object storage servers, those are the, uh, the nodes down here um, that are connected. They, they uh, serve, the, they're essentially um, data servers. And um, to provide a bit of a distinction, the, o the OSS is the, uh, it's a server node, like a x86 um, compute platform. And it sits between the external network and the actual disk, and it manages only the uh, the data in in Lustre. Uh, in some cluster file systems, um, there's well, actually, no, I'll talk about that separately later. Um, so the OSS uh, can have uh, RDMA networks. And it's really not doing any data copies um, internally. It can do RDMA directly into memory and then submit that data um, down to the disk. And um, for high availability, um, the, the storage is configured um, in an active-active manner so that uh, a pair of, of OSS nodes can each access um, the, the storage that um, the, for the pair 
And so if one of these nodes fails, then the backup node can take over the storage and serve it out to the clients. Um, so the question is, in advance of having talked about the metadata servers, I'll cover your question when we get to metadata servers, if you can make sure I'd remind me if I forget. Um, so what's um, important is that the OSS nodes, um, they, they access this the shared um, back-end storage, but what's important is that only one of the server nodes access the data at any given time. The file systems and the storage, which I'll talk about in a minute, is really only having one server accessing the storage at any given time. And so you would have a, a high availability manager that's controlling failover between that pair of nodes. And um, because software is fallible, in addition to having the high availability manager, there's also a fail-safe um, mechanism built into the, the disk file system that um, prevents multiple nodes from mounting it at the same time because we had our share of problems with the HA manager failing. Um, so in addition to the, the object storage server, there's something called the object storage target. And uh, that's, um, the OST is essentially the terminology for one backend file system. So you'd have a, a RAID um, LUN of some kind that has a locally formatted file system on it. Um, currently, that file system is uh, ext4 plus a number of patches. and. If you're familiar with with uh, Linux and ext3, so um, we developed a lot of features um, for ext3 over the years, and a lot of those got put back into the kernel and have become ext4. And um, the question marks are, what is our next file system? Um, there's some work uh, on ZFS, and there's actually a couple of sites that are experimenting with, with using ZFS, even though it's not Sun and it's not GPL. It's um, still working on that. And uh, we're also investigating um, ButterFS for the future. So um, the OST IO is done um, by a 64-bit object ID and then an array of, of, of um, offset and length of yeah. vectors. And so the, one of the important things is that the clients don't know anything at all about how the data is stored on the disks. And uh, that gives us quite a bit of flexibility in terms of changing the, the way that the, the, the data is stored on the OST. We can change the backend file system. Um, you know, you can even change the data on the fly without uh, the clients really being aware of how it's being stored. In some cluster file systems, the clients are intimately aware of the block numbers and they, they're the ones that are in charge of how the, the data is laid out on disk. And in Lustre, that's um, completely the opposite. Um, so Lustre, the, the I.O., the allocations, and the network RPCs are um, really tuned for, for large um, I.O. workloads, which are typical in HPC. It's currently a one megabyte RPC, and it, we've looking at, uh, we have patch for doing four megabyte RPCs. Some of the, the newer um, RAID controllers are happier with, you know, we think one megabyte is large enough, but they want four megabyte IOs to really drive the maximum performance. And um, the, uh, the other factor that allows Lustre to scale fairly well is that um, there's a, a, the, the lock server that manages um, the cache coherency. There's one for every OST. And so as you add in capacity and performance, um, the number of lock servers is also increasing. And so you, you get um, fairly good scalability of uh, your, your IO across a lot, large number of clients. And it was on the original slide, I didn't mention it, but um, you know, Lustre is 
fully, um, well, nearly fully POSIX compliant, and there's a few exceptions related to A time and uh, things like that, but um, it's fully cache coherent. And uh, even though there's distributed lock servers, they work together on the client to make sure that um, your data is remaining consistent, you know, in cache, regardless of having, you know, multiple readers and writers on the same file concurrently. And um, the other thing is that in Lustre, at least all of the OSTs are, are independent. They actually don't, they're not even aware of whether there's more OSTs on the same node or, um, you know, across the whole cluster. So there's no um, contention if clients are writing to different OSTs. There's no scalability issues there. And um, the performance does actually go up um, pretty linearly with the number of, of OSTs that are added into a system. So on the on the metadata side, um, so the MDS is again to, to clarify the terminology a bit. The MDS is the server, so that's a you know x86 um, box that's attached um, to the storage. It's sitting in between the clients and the disks, and the metadata server manages the you know file names, directories, path names, uh, permissions, and attributes. Um, you know. ACLs, um, extended attributes. The one thing that is sometimes confusing um, with, uh, you know, clustered meta file servers in uh, different different types of file systems is the meta the term metadata server. Sometimes, uh, depending on the file system you're talking about, sometimes the metadata server is also involved in um, controlling the file layout. Uh, so in depending on the file system, the term metadata server may also include block allocation and things like that. Uh, in Lustre, the metadata server has nothing at all to do with the block allocation for your files. It's, I mean, it, at the top level, it's, al it's in charge of allocating um, on each file which OST or which you know set of OSTs a file is allocated on, and that happens just at create time. And then after that, um, the metadata server is completely, you know, unused for doing file I/O. So the clients open the file, they get the, the file layout, and then they can work completely independently and in parallel with all of the OSTs in the file system to do I/O. And no, no, yeah. Um, currently, it does not. Um, if you're doing, uh, you know, ls minus l on a file or stat on a file, the client will fetch the file layout if it doesn't have it already, and then it queries the OSTs. And so each um, each object that lives on an OST is in charge of the file size for itself. And then when the client is is the only place where you aggregate all of the metadata into one, you know, set of attributes that you export to user space. And so as you do file I.O., there's no need to propagate back to the metadata server as the file size is changing or the blocks are being allocated or truncated or anything like that. So it, it it's a balance, depends on whether you're doing more writes or, you know, more reads, what's more efficient. Um, the, of course, the, the RPCs that go out to the, uh, to the OSTs to fetch the file size. They happen in parallel, and um, we're working for um, the you know upcoming version of Lustre that um, you can do uh, what's called stat ahead. I mean, in current in current versions of Lustre, you can do something called metadata stat ahead. So if you're doing ls minus l, and you're statting every entry in a, a directory as you do read dir, um, you can send an RPC to the metadata server. And so that has a, a improvement threshold of 50% because you're essentially pipelining your RPCs to the metadata server. And now we're going to be doing object stat ahead. 
So as soon as you get the reply from the metadata server, it asynchronously starts fetching the attributes from the data servers, and uh, that has shown quite a bit of improvement as well. And you know that's that's a workload where you know in advance which files you're going to stat. I mean, POSIX is kind of bad that way that there's not very many APIs for asynchronous operations. And, um, you know, so you're limited to know what you can fetch in advance. Um, the other thing that's interesting with Lustre is that um, you can specify the file layout um, differently on any file and um, it uh, allows you to tune the, the striping layout for your application. And so some layers like MPI.io have, um, okay, have tips for automatically choosing striping for, um, depending on how your application is using it. So the metadata target is again the system that sits in between or the, or the file system. There's currently a limit of one metadata target per file system. Uh, to answer the question, that's something that is actively being worked on to allow horizontal metadata scaling. Um, it's work that's been going on for quite a large number of years, and so I didn't want to mention anything in my slides until it's actually you know done and working. But it's it's a, a, an active project right now. And uh, the one of the things that has saved us from needing that is that the metadata target, it, it does all of its operations asynchronously. So, um, you know, lots of file systems can do synchronous I.O., um, which is easier to do but not as fast. Lustre does metadata completely asynchronously, and the clients recover um, if the server crashes. And so finally, the client um, has pretty much standard POSIX API. Um, it, it allows, you know, features, advanced features, MMAP, FLOC. Um, some of the, the reason why it's, I don't consider it con completely um, POSIX compliant, it, it doesn't do A times um, updates. Most people don't care about that. Um, it's fully cache coherent. Um, it's the client is the only place where you really aggregate everything into one giant file system, and uh, it has a write back data cache so that um, it can aggregate. You know, if your application is badly written, in my opinion, and does lots of small IOs, it can aggregate those into one IO and send it over the network. Um, the the metadata cache on the client is right through. There's no. Um, modification of metadata on the client itself. It's all done uh, over at the server side to avoid um, contention. And uh, just a little bit about what's coming up. Um, so if anybody has been following Lustre, there's been a quite a quite a bit of excitement in terms of what's happening with Oracle. Um, so the summary is nothing's happening with Oracle and instead we're doing um, the, the 2.1 release um, in conjunction with a number of other um, organizations that are interested in Lustre. Um, we're all working together and we're targeting um, this summer to get out a 2.1 release and um, we're working on uh, pushing ext4 um, scalability, you know, beyond 16 terabytes. The work is nearly done, but needs a bit of effort. And um, some of the other improved um, metadata performance for ext4 and um, scalability of single metadata servers to be more SMP um, friendly. Um, while we we you know do support SMP today, I mean once you get you know 16 cores or more, your scalability stops, and so 16 cores isn't very extreme anymore, and so we really need to address that, and that's being actively worked on. 2.1 will actually um, already has shown about double metadata performance on you know very common workloads, um, and uh, we're you know working to improve that even further. And um, in the back end, while well, ext4 is you know still chugging along, it's kind of you know showing its age. And uh, you know some some people are interested in using ZFS, um, 
and we're also looking at um, ButterFS as a you know next generation file system. But that's not in the in the short term. It'll be you know um, still a, a couple of years away at least. But um, I think that's mostly it. Yeah. That's who WAM Cloud is, in case you didn't know. We're essentially all of the people who used to work on Lustre all quit and started a new company. And so um, it's all the same people that that uh, understand Lustre and really know what's going on. And that's it.